I'm Jimmy Banfield, and you're listening to the Tools of the Trade podcast. Welcome. 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 Please welcome to another episode of the Tools of the Trade podcast, your number one construction industry resource. Hear conversations with industry professionals to get the tools, stories, and advice that you need to set your career on fire. You are now streaming the Tools of the Trade podcast. This episode is brought to you by Company Cam. What is Company Cam? Well, I thought the best way to explain it would be to paint a picture for you. Up until now, I would go out and take hundreds of photos of my projects through my phone, and sometimes they would sit there for days or even weeks before I found time to organize them. And then when it came time to sort those pictures, I would have to scroll back for hours to try and remember which project was which, then either try and upload to Dropbox, Google Drive, or plug in my phone and drag and drop onto my computer. From there, it would be either PDF editor for markups or emails back and forth, and it was just super inefficient. So I actually kind of stopped taking pictures altogether. Sound familiar? Maybe you're doing that on a project right now. Well, many listeners of this podcast, many guests on this podcast were ranting and raving about company cam, so I decided to give it a shot to see how it worked for my needs and it truly solved all of my project photo organization woes. I am currently using company cam on my projects. It took me only about 15 minutes to set up and at a bare minimum, my pictures are now instantly uploaded to the app as well as a web version attached to a project based on the GPS location the photo was taken and date and time stamped. That was already a game changer. But the beauty of company cam really comes through in the customization. You can create tags such as 24th floor or ensuite bathroom or rough in or deficiency. You can then filter and sort by those tags. You can have running dialogue on projects or on individual photos with team members. Hey, Colin, this is in the wrong spot. Okay, Joe, move it over one stud. You can mark up pictures live either at your computer or from your phone. You can print PDF reports with captions. You can do easy before and after pictures and the list goes on. If you're looking for a simple, convenient tool for project photo organization, this is the app for you. And the best part is listeners of this podcast can now get company cam for free for life for up to three users and 50 projects by visiting companycam.com backslash tools. Did you hear that? Free for life. And company cam is scalable. Like it's not just for residential or small contractors. I'm using it in large scale commercial environments. So you can take it and use it wherever you think it's going to fit in your projects. There really is no boundaries. And it's super simple to use. There's no commitment, no credit card required. And from registration to setup, like I mentioned, it only takes around 15 minutes or so. It's very quick. To discover their freemium account, as mentioned earlier, or to find a plan that suits your needs, again, head over to companycam.com backslash tools to sign up and solve all of your project photo headaches. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode number 31 of the Tools of the Trade podcast. I am your host, Colin Toop, and I created this podcast, as you probably know by now, to not only help change the blue collar optics of the construction industry, but to provide you with valuable resources that you can use to accelerate your growth, get inspired, and crush it in your construction career. As you know, I like to plug this. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Tools Podcast to contribute your questions, and I will do my best to have them answered by the guest that's coming on next. And today's guest is no exception of a fantastic guest as I sit down with Jamie Banfield, founder of Jamie Banfield Designs, or JBD for short. And JBD is a full-service, award-winning design team located in Port Moody, British Columbia, just outside of the hustle and bustle of downtown Vancouver. They specialize in creating stylish, well-edited spaces for residential renovation projects and custom home projects all over Canada. Jamie's design team offers a variety of skill sets that help transform spaces into beautiful, sustainable, and functional homes. JBD is recognized for their signature West Coast style with a focus on design for all spaces of the home and a specialty in the kitchen and bathrooms with a portfolio that includes residential projects in West Vancouver, Belcara, including Love It or List It star Todd Talbot's Lions Bay Home, a cabinetry line in the band called The Banfield, excuse me, in partnership with Kohler, 13,000 plus Instagram followers, and the recipient of 30 Under 30, Jamie is quickly establishing himself as one of the Lower Mainland's most sought-after designers. 
I was really interested in getting Jamie's story and we sat down and talked about entrepreneurship, how he got into design leadership, and we also talked a lot about what designers are, what they're not, so the common misconceptions, and what a successful design process should look like. To say hello to Jamie and the team, you have two options. Head over to Jamie Bamfield, that's J-A-M-I-E B-A-N-F-I-E-L-D dot C-A or head over to toolspodcast.com where you can always find the show notes and links to everything mentioned in these episodes. If you're looking to hire a designer, you're going to love this episode, so don't go anywhere. Jamie's coming up next. Jamie, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's this is going to be really fun. You're the first designer that I've had on the podcast, and I've got a few questions I want to ask you because I've kind of indirectly worked with you in the past. I've seen your brand out in Vancouver quite often. I've seen you all over the place. So I'm really excited to get to know you deeper on a personal level and understand what Jamie Banfield Designs is all about and your journey to get started. So the place that I'm going to get going here is the same place that I start off with most episodes is to get a bit in context as to how you got to where you are and also what a day in your life looks like. So let's start right there with, give me a snapshot of, obviously right now things are different. You're working from home, so it's completely different scenario. But if if we're back to normal and it was a typical work day from sort of the second you get up and you start thinking about work, what does a day in your life look like as a designer at Jamie Banfield and the principal designer? Yeah, well, funny enough, everyone wants to be a designer and everyone assumes that, you know, we play with these pretty products and samples and we're just going to showrooms and we've got like a glamorous lifestyle but realistically my job as like the founder the lead designer like we're a team of five what that means is I drive around most of the time so I'm driving to job sites I'm doing you know client meetings I'm doing prospect meetings I'm connected with new partners things like that and then obviously trying to like manage our team and what does that mean so every day is a little different maybe we're dealing with somebody that's off sick and our team's kind of like motto, I would say, is making the experience fun for our consumers. And a lot of people assume that what designers bring to the table is these pretty pictures. But really, we take them from kind of like, we've got this vision of we need to have a house or we need a new bathroom. And then we kind of know what we want it to look like. But how do we kind of fill in that gap in between? So, you know, my job day to day could be, you know, reviewing clients, budgets on how to hire us and how much we cost and educating consumers on what an actual designer does cost. And then same thing, what their project will cost, because ideally we don't want anybody to get into a project where the feasibility is just not there in general. Yeah, that makes sense. So what do you actually call yourself? Like what title do you go by as the founder? I do all the craft jobs. So I do anything (laughs) that nobody else wants to do. I deal with our accountant and stuff like that. I deal with, you know, if there is any issues that may come up maybe it's one of our team members is not driving the best with the consumer or you know we've got a trade on site that just doesn't want to deal with our drawings and doesn't want to just print them and read them or if anybody's out of line so sometimes you know we might have a certain partner or trade that steps up and you know they're out of line there they're not dealing with the homeowner correctly or they're trying to sweep something under the carpet which hopefully doesn't happen but it does so i'd say i deal with that stuff so i deal with a lot of things that people on our team or just in general don't want to deal with and I kind of enjoy that and I would say my job obviously it's our brand I'm in charge of what our brand looks like to consumers how we engage with everybody so there is that kind of marketing aspect attached to it also where I'm able to mold out where we want to go and be that kind of visionary on keeping the team together on we're always thinking of what our end goals are and realistically our end goals are just to make that process fun and enjoyable for the homeowner and not just these pretty pictures of a finished space. So what's your title, like your specific title? What would you call yourself? So like on our letterhead and things like that, I'm a principal designer. So pretty much lead designer. There's a lot of other, you know, words out there like creative director, all this other stuff, but really it's principal designer. And what I bring to that is on the design aspect is I love function. And, you know, I played with Lego and my dad's in construction and I've always been able to kind of look at something and figure out how to pull it apart or figure out how to put something together. So the thing I bring to any of our projects is 
majority of the time, 90% of the time, it's function. It's looking at a space plan and understanding where to move things, how to move it, and then having that visionary kind of look on everything else. And then obviously I can't do everything. So our team steps up where they've crafted their their skills on AutoCAD or specifying or knowing what products or knowing what suppliers have what in stock or knowing lead times on things like that. That's kind of the assets the whole team kind of brings together. Gotcha. So you're a pretty young guy and you've had your business for how long now? Uh, we're about eight years old. Okay. That's awesome. So what happened before Jamie Banfield started? Like, obviously, like what happened that inspired you to become a designer? And then how did that transform into you actually starting a company? Like walk me through your professional career or maybe any, any jobs that you had before this all started. Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, I didn't even know that interior design was a career or a job. So in you know, elementary school, I I played with all kinds of different things in construction, which I didn't even understand. So my dad, he's a union worker, he's in construction. All I knew was men go to work and they build things. And so on the weekends, you know, I used to build things with my dad. I worked through high school. I I worked, you know, for a plumber, worked for industrial flooring. So we laid flooring in like chicken factories and at like oh, man. Pepsi Cola and all this kind of electrician and just kind of like that's the realm I kind of grew up with. And then I didn't really get into any, you know, the McDonald's careers and entrepreneurship or business or any customer service really. But as growing up as a kid, I guess like when I look back now and have discussions with my mother, my mother's like, you were always meant to do this because just being that kind of odd child like i would grab a newspaper and i would flip to kind of like the the sales aspect where everyone's selling you know houses and i would be like hey i like the porch of this house and i like the roof of this and i would just on graph paper just like draw houses and i thought that's what kids did on the weekend they drew things and i was drawing houses and it was pretty fun because one of my i would think i was in like grade seven and my mom and dad's friend actually built a log cabin in mission And they took one of the actual drawings I did and they built pretty much like pretty close to that exact look and they framed it and put it in their house and all that kind of stuff. And so my mom, you know, she's like, she would watch me. I would, they would go for dinner, go out with their friends. And I all of a sudden would like rearrange their furniture, you know, move their kind of a brick and Ikea furniture into their dining room and pull it all apart by accident because I'm pushing their TV unit across (laughs) the floor, but they show up and their living room now is in their dining room and they got the chandelier for a dining room table just in the middle and you know as a eight-year-old ten-year-old kid I'm like hey I did a pretty good job or I would find like paint in the garage and then go paint my mom's like bedroom and then not realize that it's actually like old paint that's designed for like painting metal not painting an interior wall but I always kind of was into those type of things and then I actually moved to Australia right after high school and I went to an I prep school, so they were very focused on, you know, maths and academics. And then grade 11 and 12, I actually went to a public school and I didn't realize that it was so much art. So I jumped into like 2D arts and photography and all this other stuff, moved to Australia, kind of dabbled in like a very, very basic entry level marketing job. And then thought I was, hey, like I love print marketing. I love logos. I love all this kind of stuff. So I went to BCIT for an information night for for print marketing. And then they were also hosting an interior design kind of information night. And I was like, people get paid to do this? And I was like, cool. How do I? And because all along, I thought there was an architect or there's construction and that's it. There's nobody in right. between. I just assumed an architect did everything. And then one really funny aspect, though, is I'm working from home now the last couple of weeks. And on my desk, which I never sit at, there's a framed photograph of a business card that my best friend in elementary school made. And it's actually a business card for an interior design firm. And it's called JB Designs, which is the actual, JB Banfield Designs is our company name, but JB Designs is what's registered. And it's interior designer. And it's this card in grade seven, which I didn't even really understand that I was going to go down a path of interior design and things like that, which I think everything kind of just layers up and kind of adds on to each other um, and just kind of compounds to kind of get you to where you got to get to. That's interesting. I like that, that it's been in your blood for a long time. And I have something that I want to ask, but we'll get back to that. So if somebody wants to become an interior designer, what type of education do you think is required? Is education required? What do you need to physically become a designer? Yeah, well, I would say like with the realms of like social media and TV shows right now, most people assume that being an interior designer is 
going to job sites, picking out materials, dealing with all kinds of other things, but not necessarily. What it is, is it's you're on a computer, you're on AutoCAD, you're dealing with programs, right? So if anybody has education, I would say AutoCAD is gonna be your number one skill. So a lot of people assume that rendering, pretty pictures, that's what needed to fill it into a portfolio, whereas AutoCAD are technical skills. So if you look at kind of where we're in BC, so a technical school. So I went to BCIT and it's driven around pretty much technology and, it's, and about skills. It's not overly theory based. So if anybody's going to focus on any type of skill, I would say AutoCAD. And especially like we're a small firm, so we do fixed billables for projects majority of the time. So we'll deal with the homeowner on, you know, they're building this house. We need this many hours to get you from A to Z. So for us, we got to be efficient. So we need somebody on our team to be educated in knowing that that actual program, but also knowing how to work it properly. So we're being efficient with their time and our time and obviously their design budget. And then I would say another aspect of it is communication skills. So as a designer, my brother says that I am a salesperson with a coloring box. Like that's what he thinks my job is. And he's not too far out because when we're dealing with a homeowner, we got a project right now, we're proposing, you know, a black tile in one bathroom and we're proposing, you know, a color, like a really fun color on a cabinet. We need to sell that to the homeowner. And the way we need to sell it is we need to understand their emotion and where they're kind of getting to and what really makes them vibe and jive and feel and move and, you know, feel sad and happy. And, and so if anybody can have good communication skills on how to connect that to somebody. So if you can take something and be like, Hey, this is a product that I know is going to impact your life and this is how, instead of just being like, this is a purple thing and purple is my favorite color, so it must be yours also. <laughs> two, I would say like understanding the kind of the technical aspect of AutoCAD for sure um, and how to use that, but then also the communication skills on being able to sell and understand the whole sales process. Because in the sales process, you're literally listening, you know, whether you're selling a car or a house or a tile technically to a homeowner you're selling them by listening to what they're giving back to you what they need you know what they're saying no to and why they're saying no and we've had projects where you know a homeowner has literally said no to something but the more we dive into it really they're okay with that product they're okay with what it is it's something else behind them so maybe it's a budget aspect or it's it's something different, which we need to kind of zone through. So I think if, if somebody brings those two skills into any type of design atmosphere, whether working for a large firm, a small firm, or independent, those will be skills that will will help craft them for sure. So why not just go work for a big firm? Like, why did you decide that this is what you want to do for yourself? Take on the burden of being a stressed out business owner. What sparked the entrepreneur side of, of this journey? I didn't know. My career started, I... I worked in construction when I was going through BCIT and then ended up working at Home Depot. And Home Depot was probably the best education platform for me. Like, I I don't know if it's exactly the same, but back in the day, you know, I had full-time hours, I had full-time benefits, and they taught me so much. So what would happen was I would go out and learn, you know, two weeks full-time of tile. And they would they would compensate that they would pay nine to five to do that. So I learned so many other avenues on setting materials, what actually grout is. Whereas you know a typical designer these days they're specifying a grout and maybe a texture, but why is something unsanded or why is something sanded and all this kind of stuff. So that kind of led me into then I worked in kitchens at at Home Depot and then I ended up working for uh, Merritt Kitchen. So I learned kind of millwork, cabinetry, all this kind of stuff, and all that kind of just kind of compounded into you know all these additional skills but from there I went and worked for a small interior design firm and I just assumed that's kind of the realm of what it was we kind of parted ways and I went to one of my the suppliers that we had as a small firm and they were like go do this by yourself like you're doing it there's a lot of things that you're doing well just keep building on those and what it did is it kind of opened up to me being like not that I want to like change the norm or be something different or groundbreaking, but I was like, there's certain aspects to this business that don't sit correctly for me. So that business was designed in a way where 
they would design something, but they would want to sell the product. So they would want you to, you know, we design it and then we sell you the tile. You buy the tile from us, the lighting. So I felt like that was, you know, the design firm, it wasn't better from the homeowner. Whereas, you know, the Jamie Banfield design model is we don't purchase anything. So we specify. So what that means is to a homeowner, when we're designing, let's say, a kitchen, there's so many countertop options for them. Whereas if we were a supplier or a dealer of one product, we would pigeonhole them into only using X amount of colors or X amount of materials or not fitting the best. So that kind of led me into jumping on my own and kind of just starting, you know, JMF Designs. And and it was kind of forced off of, there was a disagreement. We didn't kind of work out well working together after a couple of years, but then really there was these underlining things that I knew was not correct in our industry that I thought we could kind of break the mold a little bit and do correctly. And at the end of the day, give, you know, a good experience and watch for the outcome for what the homeowners, that's what we're hired to do. You know, it's funny you say that because I've talked to quite a few people now. I think even though as of this point, I've only released 23 episodes, I've got about 30 that have been recorded. And I attract and I look for a specific type of person when I'm interviewing. That's typically somebody that's quote unquote made it or done well in their career, whether it's owning a business or not. And it, it seems as though a lot of people fall back on being ethical. And those are the people that I see as the market and industry leaders are the ones that aren't taking the shortcuts and that are taking the ethical path to build their business and doing what's right for the homeowner or the builder, whatever trade or whatever type of business they own. And that's, it's interesting you say that because you're, you're another person that is trying to break the mold to do the ethical thing in the industry, which I think we're all striving for in, in some degree. And I appreciate hearing and, and seeing that. And it's definitely coming through in your work big time. Well, thank you. Now, there's multiple types of firms. You mentioned that there's some that's, you know, spec their own product and it's kind of like an investment firm selling their own stock options or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, and I see that and it, it can pigeonhole that client into choosing only from that selection. And obviously it limits your design capabilities, but I'm sure that there's other competitors in your industry that are also specking products that are being purchased by whether it's a general contractor or the electrician or whoever's on site. So what do you think, like, when I picture a designer in my head, you know, nothing's coming to mind. But if I think of somebody specific or I think of a specific type of builder, I think of a specific style. So when somebody says, oh, wow, this is a Jamie Banfield design, what does a Jamie Banfield style or design look like? There must be an underlying pattern of things that you guys do or a style you have, like your own flair. Yeah, I would say we do. But at the end of the day, we don't. So our our main bad aid, the whole team, you know, we're not picking, like I mentioned before, like purple. I remember back in the day, I had an assistant when I worked for a different company and her favorite color was purple. So if she was kind of tasked to work on something, there'd be elements of purple in there. And I was like, this is all wrong because you're not focusing on kind of the mandate or like what somebody wants. Because, you know, color makes people feel differently. People, men or female, they look at color completely different. They react to it differently. So like you got to kind of understand who wants it, who's using it, what it's used for, and then kind of get to that end result. But I would say for us as a team, I would say being detail oriented for sure. There's little things that we've added into our process. So we follow a process. And that was something in the beginning that I wasn't really understood that there is a process. It's design. It's, you know, you get taught all these skills in school, but how do you actually put them into a to Z. So kind of developing that through, then kind of understanding our homeowners, what we work with, I would say we attract certain people. And I think that's kind of where our style is kind of blossoming and understood. So I think the people we're attracting, I think we're attracting professionals, like majority of our clients, the younger, you know, they're family orientated, they're professionals, like they're lawyers or they're doctors or they're the people that are trying their hardest to do something. And I think we connect on that moral kind of foundation of what we stand for. And then I think like the style just evolves from that. So not necessarily me or my team, the style is evolving from who they are. So they're looking for something a little bit different. They want timeless. They want something that's sustainable in a way that it's responsible, not necessarily it's sustainable in they want to have a stamp that is being told that this is green. I feel good, but they want to do something that's, that's responsible. So you know, like we sent an email a couple of weeks ago saying that we've taken a stand, we're working out of our home offices. And that means that we actually are working. We're not sitting down watching Netflix. We've set up offices and the setback from, or the, 
the communication back from our homeowners was like, good for you. We're behind you. Like, this is amazing. You know, we had one or two people that were like, no, we want to meet face to face. Where looking at the broad scheme of who our clientele is, they're not really fitting in perfectly well with our team, to be honest. Whereas everyone else that kind of was like, this is a great decision. This is smart. Like, thank you for doing this. They fit. And then I also think like, Males and females see design a little bit differently. So textures and, and tactile elements and more moody things come out, like literally the male eye sees it differently than the female eye. So there's a lot of texture in our, our designs based off of that. I also grew up in the UK. So I moved here when I was 11 and I fell in love with BC. I fell in love with the West Coast, like the mountains, the trees, you know, the waters, like the rusty boats, the washed up logs, you know, the snow melting, all this type of stuff, which so like when you look at our designs, you're going to see elements of those. You're going to see, you know, tactile woods and you're going to see metals pulling through or you're going to see natural stones or quartz that looks like stone. And you're going to see this contrast in color. So when you look at kind of BC, the sunset, you've got the blue, you've got the green and then you've got orange. Right. So that's very complementary colors. And that's colors I like to wear also. So those kind of pull through to get to what our style is. Interesting. I like that. So now when it comes to industry specifics, I wanted you to basically set the record straight as to what the difference between a designer, a decorator, and now that you mention it, I guess an architect is like, what is the difference between those three disciplines? Because I've heard them used interchangeably and they're definitely not the same thing. No, yeah, they're not. And I would say they do get muddled a lot for sure. There's there's all different types of things out there. But I would I would say a decorator, typically what a decorator will typically, education-wise, they typically have a certificate or lower in education. So education is a little bit different, but their skills, like they're not zoned in on building codes, how to actually design something to be built necessarily on construction avenue side. But, you know, maybe they can take on, you know, a renovation of a bathroom or things like that, maybe. Whereas I think designers... They're going to say no. They want anything construction related that needs to be documentation correctly done. They're taking on that avenue. So a decorator will kind of deal with things like, you know, new furniture, paint, maybe a couple cabinets, countertops, things like that going into a space. And then what an interior designer will do is typically they're they're working on documentation. So what documentation means is they're building up demolition plans. They're building up drawing packages for the city for permits. They're dealing with construction drawings so what walls to be built what they're made from and then reflected ceiling plans so how is the lighting going to be installed and and that kind of avenue so they take it at like a couple steps above what a decorator would do and typically they're coming in for bathrooms kitchen renovations possibly new additions possibly small new build spaces and then ideally one step above that i would say right now which we're seeing kind of uh, a norm is like a architectural technician so they're coming in and they're calling themselves like home designers so what that is is they have education but they're not they're not an architect they're not an engineer they don't have authority to stamp things and and liability all this stuff but what they can do is they can design a home so they can they can be the home designer so the the exterior the interior and then they'll take that to an engineer or an architect to kind of stamp off of. And then an architect, what they'll do is they'll look at everything from the outside to the inside. And majority of the projects we work on that are new builds, we work with an architect. So maybe the homeowner has found the architect or the builder, and then GV Alpha Design is going to do the interior. But it's really funny how our scope of work really crosses over. And it crosses over big time between an architect and a designer. Architects has a lot more education than a typical designer does. Designer typically would have like a diploma, architect would have a, you know, a bachelor's or a degree or all kinds of other things on there. So they do have typically a bigger avenue of education, but it's really funny how they work. So I think the best project is actually having an interior designer and an architect. And the reason for it is the architect will look at the house as curb appeal, whereas J. Manfield Designs or an interior designer will look at the house as far as curb appeal with your Christmas lights on. So where's your Christmas lights going to get plugged into? Where's it going to get switched? Which I know everyone's like, eh, whatever. Or like when you're designing this house, where are the planters or this bench on the on the front porch actually going to fit? Do you have enough room? Do you have enough room on your front door to actually get a sofa in the house? And then also when you enter the house, we look at function, whereas a typical architect will lay out, let's say it's cabinetry. And I would say the biggest thing we jump into as soon as we hit a project is we want to look at space planning right away. And some homeowners are like, no, 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 the architect already worked on this. Leave it alone. 
But really, when we actually start diving into this, we're like, you want to put millwork, so cabinetry in your dining room on one side of the room and the other side, not so much. So your window is symmetrical, you know, centered on the outside. But when you're inside that dining room, all of a sudden, because you're doing this built in, you're about 18 inches. Now the window's not center. Now your lighting won't be center and all this other stuff. So an architect and designer will look at things a little differently. So architects, when looking at interiors, they'll do rough numbers. So let's say it's your kitchen cabinets in your kitchen. They're looking at 24 inches deep. Whereas when a designer will look at it, they're looking at 25 and a half, and then they can look at your casing on your door and how all this kind of interacts. So I would say a best project when you're working on a large, large renovation or a new build is to have a designer and an architect, and ideally they'll work really well together. Interesting. I didn't know that. I guess they do cross scopes quite a bit, and that's why people interchange them. And then you've got you've got your your typical general contractor. And from my experience and in some of the conversations I've had in, in my career, there is two camps. So you got the camp of GCs that is saying, I'm building this house, I'm smacking the two by fours in, so I'm calling the shots. And I'm going to get my electrician to send me what he thinks is an RCP. I'm going to get my plumber to pick fixtures, and we're just going to go at it and build this thing. And then you got the other camp of GCs that says that they build some of them exclusively with designers, they prefer to have the design. Why do you think in terms of the general contractor's point of view, it's beneficial to have the designer and not just try and tackle this job on their own, thinking that they they have all the skills necessary to build this with the flow and the effectiveness that could happen from that? Yeah, I think both avenues can set up to success. Uh, most of our projects, there's a budget involved. And somebody needs to be accountable for the budget. So ideally what a designer will do is they'll be responsible for kind of creating this plan. So the way I kind of explain it to our homeowners is when you set out, you're going to say, hey, we want to have Easter dinner. So what is that? And then you got to narrow it down. So by the time that builder kind of gives a quote, because they don't have anything substantial, they're going to go off and maybe past experiences or generic budgets. They're not actually going to understand exactly what is needed here, here, here. So they're going to give you a generic budget. But if a homeowner needs more of like a detail budget, as far as we want to know where everything's going, how much things are going to cost, they should bring in a designer. And the reason for that is they're going to build you that recipe. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to nitpick each kind of detail. And one example I kind of put out there is, let's say you're designing a kitchen. You're building an island, so your island is X amount of square feet. Everyone wants this big, large island these days. So a typical, like I would say, decorator or just the builder on his own will be like, hey, do you like this cabinet color? Perfect. Our cabinet guys will get you a price. Do you like this countertop? Perfect. That's great. But what nobody is really understanding in that whole realm of things is nobody is actually checking how big that exact island is prior to for the design, and nobody's checking the the size of the slabs of the stone. So if we want a certain edge cut on that stone, we know we have to deduct three inches on all perimeter of the slab. So ideally what, what that benefits the homeowner is, are they gonna be buying one slab for this island or do they have to buy two and have a seam? Whereas if they don't have that plan predetermined in the beginning, they're not going to know that until the cabinets get installed. And then the countertop guys come and measure it. And then they're like, oh, excuse me, Mr. Smith, we need to have two pieces of stone here and there needs to be a seam in the middle. Whereas if somebody actually designs the plan, picks out the materials correctly, details them on drawings, you'll know exactly what you're going to get. So if you're like, I don't want to buy two slabs. I also don't want to seam. Maybe just making that island one inch shorter will get you one full slab with no seams and you're only buying one set of material. So an actual designer, a majority of the times, you know, a friend of mine, you might look at the budget and be like, whoa, that's a lot of money for design. But technically that money that you're going to spend on a designer, you'll get all that money back off of the, the issues or the mistakes or, or just knowing in advance. So let's say that kitchen that you're designing, before you order the cabinets and before you order the countertops, you would know all the details. So then you can justify, you have everything outlined, you know exactly what everything's costing, you know what's gonna impact what. And then same on the domino effect. Like there's one project we're working on right now and not throw anybody under the bus, but we just got an email and you know they've the project's been running for a couple months and they're ready to order tile and they're they want tile to show up next week. So their email to us was reselect tile products because we need this in three days. And whereas when you look at our design drawing package if you flip to the back pages it shows you every tile and we have every lead time on there and we have every contact so really if 
the design is used with the intent of using it correctly, you're able to outweigh the benefits of those and you're able to to make sure you're ahead of the game on those type of things. Whereas, you know, if it was a builder just doing it by himself and said, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, go down to the tile store, pick out your tile, we need it for next week. They're not really going to understand what they're picking. Maybe they're not going to, you know, have the broad range. Whereas a designer, our office, we have a sample room and we have maybe 20 different tile suppliers with a product coming in and we're able to pick the best, but also the the more durable and the most cost-effective products from each different supplier, not necessarily just buying from one. Gotcha. So it sounds like the devil's in the details. I would say so. And I mean, like, it's just building a recipe. So most of our homeowners, they know what they're wanting to accomplish. They know what their end picture is kind of going to look like. You know, they want to have a kitchen that has like wood and metal or this or this. They want an island with stone on it. They want two sinks. They they want hardware. They, they know those details, but they need that recipe to get them. So like talking about Easter dinner, right? You know that you're making a turkey, but until you figure out exactly all the details, like how many potatoes do you actually boil? Like, like how do we not waste having food? Like how do you make sure that gravy is cooked the exact same time as this? Like we kind of build that recipe to get them to the end instead of just being like slap it together, get us what you need. Got it. That makes sense. I understand it a lot differently than I did before talking to you. So that's a good thing. So I've, I've got two short questions I want to ask you before I want to get into your design process. I think, I believe it's a 10 step process, is it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a few specific questions I want to ask you about that and we're going to rip through it and it'll be a good chance for you to expand on a few of those things. But one of the questions that that I have for you is in relation to sub trade. So obviously I owned a small electrical contracting company prior to moving to Toronto and my new life that I have here. And what, one of the thoughts that is common among sub trades, potentially builders as well, is in order to expand our reach into the market, we're looking for more sales. So we want to partner with people. And do you find it to be beneficial to reach out to a designer as a sub trade to say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. Keep our card in your back pocket. If you ever need anything, call us. Do you think that that's a good avenue to pursue or do you prefer to not deal directly with a sub trade? We want to work directly with sub trades. So yeah, I think it's a great idea for any trade to connect with any other trade. So I see us as a designer, like we are another trade that's in this picture that's we're all working together for the best interest of the homeowner. So a designer, like we would work with trades on site. We would not, not necessarily hire them though. So us, we just, we do the specifying. So typically, ideally there's a general contractor or a home builder, they would hire all the trades. But saying that though, there's a lot of times where we're in situations where the contractor might need an additional quote on something or their go-to person can't facilitate, or we're looking at a design aspect where their trade is not going to be able to do it. So, you know, we've had installs of large sheet tiles. Let's say it's a big porcelain tile or things like that on the backsplash where we want mitered edges cut on tiles where not every tiler out there is going to be able to do this. So sometimes we're bringing details to the contractor and they're like, hey, our guys can't do this. And we're like, not a problem. Here's somebody that we've tested here or done this well with and whatnot. And I would say one of our best is there's a welder that we work with and we connected with them on Instagram of all places. And when you think of a welder, you're like, oh, great. They're doing all this kind of stuff behind the scenes. They're doing beams, all this stuff. But they've ended up making us hood fans. They've made us stairs. They've made us railings. They've made us backsplashes. They've made us door handles. They've made us ra- – like. and the reason we keep coming back to these people to build this is because of what they do. The moral aspect of what we are and what they are, we connect really well. Like They're in it to do a great job. They want the homeowner to be happy. They take pride in their craft. So when we get suppliers, whether it's products or showrooms or trades that reach out to us, and I would say we get, you know, a couple a week that reach out. And I would say they're doing in the wrong avenue. So the way they reach out is they will compensate us. They'll say, hey, we'll give you a cut here or we'll give you a commission here. And I'm so proud of our team. Like we take zero commissions from anybody. So no furniture stores, no products, no trades, nothing, because they don't get it. What we want is we want our customers to be happy. So what we ask for is do your job, do your job properly, take the time to quote properly, like take the time to think about the project, like give us realistic expectations on budget and timelines, and then be proud of your work, like stand behind it, want to do better, always want to evolve. And I would say those people, they win over 
giving someone cutbacks. And that was one of the reasons that kind of I did jump on my own because me picking a product for a homeowner and, you know, me guiding that homeowner to use a certain product or a certain trade based off of my financial gain is not correct because I'm already getting paid for my services anyway. And then also I think like when they're reaching out, reach out correctly. So like we put time on our website, we made an actual page for partners, trades to go there, you know, fill it us application kind of thing. Just give me your name, your email address, phone number, what you want, and then send it in. Right. But I mean, like we'll get people that are reaching out. They're sending us a message on Facebook or they're, they're doing kind of all these other things where it gets very muddled. And if you want to kind of connect professionally, just show up, give us a business card, come to an event, you know, that we're at, give us a business card, set up a lunch. Let's go have lunch and talk about what you could do. And nine out of the 10 times, we're able to kind of work them into certain projects. And I would say also, small guys are big guys. Like I remember our first design job and our first new custom home, the homeowners were like, hey, do you have a portfolio based off of what we're trying to build? And my answer to them was like, no, but I can explain to you how this project might be a bigger scale, but the underlining elements are there. So I think if anybody's like, they're trying to connect and be like, I haven't done this before, this is something different. Don't be scared to reach out either. Because really, if you're underlining morals and you're underlining kind of ethics and education, all this kind of stuff sits in there, then you should be able to do a good job anyway. Amazing. Jamie Banfield can't be bought. Yeah, no. <laughs> I love it, man. So I want to get into your design process because I, I think it's great. And you mentioned that's kind of your one of your differentiators that you have as a company. And I think it's important. And we've talked about this prior. We had a, a quick call, I believe it was about a month ago, and we talked about educating homeowners and, and the whole process. So I want to start off with, with what you call the meet and inspire. But before the meet and inspire, what percentage of work do you think comes from general contractors versus a homeowner that finds you first? I'd say like 70% of our work comes from consumers. So it's it could be, you know, we've met them at a trade show, we've met them at a consumer show, or they've seen us on TV or in a magazine or on social media or word of mouth, right? We've wrapped up a project and there's a project we worked on in Port Moody. It's literally a couple blocks away from our office. It was a condo renovation and, you know, we've already finished another project based off of that. We're working on two more based off of that. And we've done a couple other quotes based off of that one project. So a lot of them are coming directly from from consumers. And I would say some of our jobs, we they don't have a contractor and some of them do. So we'll connect the dots on, hey, here are three guys that we worked with that we like, that we know can kind of tackle this in. And other times, you know, the contractor's like, Jamie, we worked with you in the past, or we're going to try working with you. Here's a project that we'd love to, you know, collaborate on. Here you go kind of thing. Got it. So after that relationship is established and you're deciding to proceed with the work, you you start with your meet and inspire phase. And what is the first interact like a good interaction with a homeowner when you first sit down to start going over fundamentals and what the project's going to look like? What are the key things that you're trying to to either instill in them or take away out of them uh, for yourself to learn more about what like who they are and what they're looking for? Like, what does the first step look like? Yeah, so the reason why we do a Meet and Inspire and when we call it a Meet and Inspire is kind of going back to that, my old, old job. Like, if you want us to come out to your home or you want to talk to us, we're going to charge you $250 for a consultation. And it was very short-minded. So we call it a Meet and Inspire. I, Jamie Banfield, you know, the principal designer of our firm, I go to each and every one of these. And what it's designed for is exactly what it's called. And that's why I call it Meet and Inspire. I want to go there. I want to meet with these people and see what they're trying to do. And then also they get to meet with me and see what I'm trying to do. But then also, like, can I inspire them on their project? So am I going to walk in there all frumpy and being like, oh, this is too expensive. You're not going to afford this or we're six months away. We're too busy. Or am I going to get in there and inspire them? Be like, yeah, just like Home Depot, right? You can do this. We can help. Obviously, some projects we're not able to because some we go in there and the expectations are just too tight. And I'll flat out tell them like, A, we're super tight on this budget, but we know we can get you to somewhere, phase one, phase two. Sometimes it's we're not able to. Whereas I know other designers like my peers, as soon as you talk to them on the phone, they're going to say, hey, if you don't have X amount of budget, we're not going to meet with you face to face. So the Meet and Inspire, what it's designed to do is I get out there, we sit down, it's about an hour, an hour and a half, and we go through anything and everything they want to in their project. But what I'm doing is I'm listening and I'm gathering all the information. So I remember this one client, we went out there and you know they wanted to meet at like a 5.30 in the evening. I go out there 
and you know they've got their son in his bedroom he's sitting in, in, on his bed they finish their dinner everything's cleaned up they want me to talk to the son about what he wants in his bedroom and they're going to do a whole reno of this this townhouse and then what happens is is he then goes to a babysitter and he goes plays with a couple buddies down the street and i deal with mom and dad and then we kind of go through a whole hour and a half and then as i'm leaving it's raining and the homeowner the husband's like wait a minute here's an umbrella so he grabbed two umbrellas and he's like i'll walk you to your car so like the understanding of what that that homeowner is just on how they greet me, how they talk to me, how they respect my time and how they care. Like they care that I'm going to get wet going to my car or not. Like that says a lot of things about getting into a relationship. So it's kind of like the way I see it. It's like, it's our first date, right? We're going on a first date and not that I, I want to be smooth, but I want to know that <laughs> when stuff comes down to it, like we're able to take care of each other and we're able to, to work well. And ideally it is a relationship because some of these projects we're working with homeowners if they're building a house, we're in there for two years, right? And we're communicating sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes multiple times a week, sometimes once a month. And we're gonna be able to kind of connect that through. And I would say our closing rate from that is a lot higher than us going in there and looking short-minded. So if we went in there and said, hey, here's an hour of Jamie's time, it's X amount of money, write us a check, give us your credit card, we'll come in for an hour and gather that money. We're able to give that product away for free, but really, we gain it back for sure. Got it. So after that point, you have your conversion, they hire you. So that's your were hired phase. And then you go in for site findings. And what exactly are you looking for an in investigation? And if you can think of something off the top of your head, what's the craziest thing that you've found, whether it's like freaky, or it's like complete disaster, anything that comes to mind? Yeah, well, site findings, ideally, we're going in there. And we're we're documenting. So we're, we want measurements and we want photos and we just want to document what is there. And I would say, I'll hit that that point about the freakiness, but one of the, the downfalls is, is we follow our process to the T. And I would say probably about a year ago, a contractor was like, hey, do not do site findings. We are have this all documented. Here you go. So we were like, okay, fine. And then they're pretty much like, we'll save the money. And it's not that much money to do it. It's, it's a couple of hours. But we designed the whole thing. We ended up getting out there and the house was not actually built to those drawings. And the contractor didn't actually take that on their own to measure things up. So we had to really do our work double over. We had to redesign everything to make it all work. So the site findings is very important. Some people might want to kind of chew away from it, be like, oh, no, I can get measurements. I can do this. But ideally, we're going in there and we're getting the exact measurements, the exact photos. But things that we're looking for is, you know, electrical panels. Like if you want to add, you know, a steam shower to your your condo, like are you able to add that in with how much power you have in the home? Or can we actually get this slab of stone through your front door and onto the second floor because that's where your kitchen is? I would say kind of the, the freakiest things that we've ever found is this just kept coming back to mind, like since you asked this question. And it's not so much true. Okay. When we get in there, the homeowners get very excited and they try to explain to us like what they want. And they, I'm not going to explain who this customer was, but there's two stories that, that keep coming up. And one of them was she had to have a TV in the bedroom. And I was like, oh, do we really need to? Like, let's try and work this out. She's like, I need to have a TV in the bedroom. I need to have a TV in the bedroom. I need to have a TV in the bedroom. And by the end of it, she's like, listen, I'm single and I got to watch my single movies. And I was like, got it tv in your bedroom <laughs> and there was another one where we're walking through and they're trying to show us what they want in their shower and it's a husband and wife and they're kind of reenacting certain scenes of maybe oh my god to show us <laughs> how much space they need in their new shower we need a grab bar over here we need a seat there we need a big anchor in the center of <laughs> pretty hard like this is how wide it needs to be because of this angle and we're like got it cool and that's a cool thing like because i mentioned the whole like setting up that mean inspire thing properly it's we really do jump into that that relationship right so it's when you get into that you're able to be more intimate and you're able to share more and and we're able to understand really what you're trying to accomplish and nobody's judging in any of these things right so it's it adds humor for sure but i mean it's a part of who they are as lifestyle and they're paying us professionals to come in here and create a space. Right. So those are kind of the two kind of like, I would say that just kept coming back in my head about <laughs> the freakiest things that we've seen. I mean, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more. So in our head, it's probably going to be like, eh, it's an average Tuesday. No kidding. <laughs> so after you've gone, you've done your site findings, there's 
three interim steps before we get to furniture selection. So we've got the space planning and function, the concept curation, and then the design development. So you keep using the word function and I want to know what your definition of function is for a space. Cause I've heard of, I think it's called like the working triangle in a kitchen and everybody has their own thing that they're trying to deploy within here. Oh, you have to follow this functionality plan that we read about in this magazine. That's how we're all going to be able to cook in this kitchen together. But what does functionality mean to you? Yeah. Functionality to me just means the least amount of steps to do whatever you're trying to do. And so Going back to BCIT, I actually failed one of my classes based off of that work triangle you're talking about in the kitchen because I battled it and was like, this is wrong. It's not correct. And just like analyzing like how I would use the kitchen because really the triangle is based off of like cooking, refrigeration, and sink. But if you look at how you use your kitchen every day, it's probably a work surface, a sink, and storage, some sort of storage, whether you're grabbing milk or you're grabbing a sandwich or you're you're doing a protein shake, whatever you're doing, like it's not always cooking and always fridge. So I battled that in school and yeah, did not do well because I battled school, but function to me and our team is just the usability of something and the least amount of steps. And and it's things like laundry rooms, right? Like you can get a pretty picture, you can get a pretty looking laundry room, but ideally like we look at like, okay, hey, how does the laundry get from, where is it? So on that meet and inspire, we can tell that the laundry actually lands on everyone's bedroom floors, not in a hamper, or or it actually gets to the laundry room. And then maybe the laundry room needs to be on the second floor because it's less amount of steps for the homeowner. So instead of having in the basement where mom is taking down four sets of bedding every week down to the basement, maybe she needs it on that second floor. So we kind of look at function on big avenues like that. So where is everything and how it all works together. But then when we look at function, we want to look at things like how thing, doors open. So let's say we're talking about a family of four and we're looking at their entrance. Well, what does your morning look like? So how do you get the kids out of the house? How does guests get welcomed? How do you guys come home after school? How do you go to church? Like all these type of things. And it might sound crazy, oh yeah, whatever. But you know, if we can pivot the front door and make it swing a different direction because they're able to actually open the closet and go to the front door. And I think function a lot of times it's breaking people's habits. So sometimes I would say more kind of our middle-aged, older clientele, they are kind of stuck in their ways of like, this is how we've done it. So we're like, let us think differently. And maybe the thinking differently doesn't work out well. So like my kitchen at home, I'm in a one bedroom condo and we have a 24 inch wall oven. So that is a lot smaller than typical 30 inches is typical whereas we have a 36 inch gas cooktop which is bigger than the norm and we're able to make dinner for 12 let's say for thanksgiving whereas it's understand the function of how our fridge works to our oven to our our cooktop so when you're actually making these dinners we're going to be using the cooking elements a lot more than we are the oven so it's even function sometimes that plays out and we've got elderly that we're working with and in her showers we're putting in electrical it's called dtv it's it's an electrical thermostat for a shower and what does that do for her does lots of stuff she doesn't have to clean as much so what she can do is she can hit mode on this thing and and the mode will it will blast hot water for 15 minutes which obviously might not be the the most eco-friendly but what it does for her is she's able to spray down her shower set this mode All of her shower heads go on for 15 minutes, rinses off her entire shower. She can clean up a little bit of it. So like function can be done in so many different ways. It doesn't just have to be just like a, how do you walk through a space? So it's mainly about how you you live through the space and and how to make that easier and more functional. So I understand that part. And then when it comes to the concept creation or curation, excuse me, I'm sure that at some point, and maybe I'm mixing my steps up, but at some point you're going to be be presenting an end design to somebody. And I'm sure at some point in your career, they've come back to you and said, that just doesn't look like my Pinterest board, or I'm really not happy with what you've presented me. So how do you navigate that conversation? I guess this kind of ties into budget as well. Maybe maybe at some point after the design, you're like, look, we've just decided that this is going to be the best approach, but it's a little bit more than you you are looking to spend. So there's navigating that aspect of the relationship too. And as you mentioned, with any relationship, those are tough conversations to have. So what would you recommend or how do you navigate those 
touchy conversations. Yeah, I mean, this brings me back to, I remember a job many years ago where we went out there and we presented the whole design to the homeowners. The wife was like nodding her head like, yes, 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 yes. And the husband just like stopped us halfway through and was like, am I on a TV show? Am I being punked? And we were like, no, I don't think so. But like, it was so online with what the wife wanted and it was so offline of what the husband wanted. And, you know, trying to manipulate both avenues to fit that in. And there was another job we worked on and we're presenting master closets and we're going through this whole closet and the husband's like jumping up and down and like, yes, 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 yes. And then we're like, okay, and let me show you his. And he's like, what? That's tiny. <laughs> and we're like, okay, so if we flip the his and the hers, that's okay. And then pretty much that's what happened. Like, he got the hers and she got the his. Interesting. So a lot of times we kind of assume things, which we should never do. So there's only so much information we can take away right at the beginning. And then as we're developing these concepts and designs, we're looking for that feedback. So we want people to be like, hell no, this is completely wrong. Or Jamie, you're crazy. This is going off to left field. Or this is perfect. And ideally, revision after revision after revision, we get to the exact kind of like, I'm in love with everything, right? There's only one project ever that we presented a concept and the homeowner was like, do it. And I was like, okay, like you need to go sit and think, you need to develop, like you need to go research. And she pretty much was like, nope, do it. And that was a really fun project, but it was just do it right off the bat. So there is avenues that you got to go through. And I, I think we're on stage kind of talking about design and stuff like that at these consumer shows. The one thing I think that just creates so much stress for so many people is emotion. So if they can take emotion away from every design choice they're doing, so take the emotion out of like, you know, my sister has this, or I fell in love with this and I don't know why, or I'm being stubborn. My husband likes this, so I need to not like this. I think like if you get rid of any emotion and actually make thought process on why am I doing this? What's going to happen? And does it come back to that overall end result? So if you're trying to create a spa-like bathroom and we're putting all these finishes that take tons of maintenance, that's not going to be that spa-like atmosphere all the time. It just be that spa atmosphere when you're having that that one tub. But when you're sitting in there staring up at all these mirrors and things that need to be cleaned, that's taking your spa completely away. So I think kind of like looking at those avenues, uh, going through there, through the concept creation. And ideally... When somebody gets a design package, they're going through multiple different steps and they have to do a lot of homework on their own and they might have to take time off work. So I think some consumers don't really understand that they got to put in just as much energy as we put in too. Yeah, that makes sense. So as I mentioned, we have the concept curation, the design development, which is exactly what it sounds like. So that's that's the physical design coming to life, the furniture selection, and then you've got your drawing package, which is being issued for construction at that point, and then your budget review. And then I'm just going to breeze through the last couple here. We've got design approval, which is, I'm assuming, the stamp saying that this is what's going on. We're giving her on this project. It's issued for construction. And then we've got construction support. So what kind of support are you lending the the actual build away from the homeowner and, and keeping them preoccupied and making sure that things are aligning? What kind of support are you offering on site? Yeah, so I think like the issue for construction are probably is probably the most critical part of the whole project. So what that does is it gives a line in the sand to the contractor being like, okay, this is everything prior to, this is our thinking process, and this is our recipe. This is what the homeowner is approved to do. So what it does is that it kind of stops a lot of change orders because they've gone through these things and then we've kind of drawn a line in the sand and said, okay, we're done. This is where we're we're handing it over here and what's done. So type of things that we deal with on construction support is any technical question. So if any trade or sub trade has a question about an install or product, we're there 100%. And sometimes, you know, if it's a new relationship with a new contractor, they don't want to reach out to us and tell us, hey, we're actually building this thing. This got built wrong. Or the space is actually two inches smaller because this and this and this happened, where we want to update our drawings right away and we want to give that to everybody involved because what it does is it makes the homeowner approve it and they're happy but then every other trade coming through it's like a domino effect anything that needs to be revised is revised and then you know there's certain things like maybe products get shipped to site and they're damaged maybe there's out of stock items so sometimes we're reselecting so instead of the contractor going to the homeowner and being like hey you got to pick a new tile the contractor will be like jamie this happened, we would go to the homeowner with a solution. So we say, hey, Mr. Smith, the tile that we wanted, 
it got smashed on site in shipping. You know, it's a 12 week order. You can A, wait for the tile. We don't recommend that because it's gonna slow A, B, C, D down. But here's two other choices. This one is in stock. Maybe it's a little bit more. This one is two weeks away and maybe it's a little bit less. So what a designer can do in kind of the communication level is take that problem a contractor has, find a solution, and then all the reach out to the homeowners is very solution-based. It's not problem-based because a contractor might be like, find us a new tile. We don't know what you want. Find it. Whereas we're bringing it to them being like, here's a solution that pleases the construction side. And we know this pleases your, your design, the durability, the budget, the function, whatever aspects of why we chose that initial product. And I think a lot of homeowners also going through that they just want somebody to to have their back, right? Because there's so many choices that were made way in advance. And pretty much all we're doing is we're documenting. So we're gathering information. So we're taking photos on site. Maybe we're doing walkthroughs with trades. So maybe our initial design isn't going to be implemented properly because of the budget got cut. Maybe, you know, there was unforeseen stuff of they had to redo the roof where that was never in, in the, the initial design or, or now that they're doing this, we're going to do the basement just because we had to, because we're just in here. We just want to. So at times going through the communication at that level, we might need to redesign, redevelop, but we're going back to the initial thought process of where we were in there in the beginning. And then I would say for the, the homeowner, the pleasing avenue for that is when we do go to site, we do work with all the trades and all the contractors pretty well, but we're there to to pinpoint mistakes too, right? We're like, hey, there's supposed to be no window there or that window is supposed to be a little bit lower. So we're kind of checking our work and their work and same thing for the contractor, right? When we're doing our design package and we're issuing for construction and they're reviewing it all, like they can be like, hey, Jamie, there's a mistake here. or So we're able to cross-reference and we're able to double-check each other's work to make sure that the homeowner gets the right product, the right material on site, or the right install look. Got it. And then after we've we've gone through construction and done our deficiency review and you've gone through and styled and, and make it all fresh, then you've got the reveal to the client. And I'm sure that this is probably a ton of emotion involved in revealing the final product to a client's do you have any good memories of, of favorite reveals or any good stories of what's happened when you've shown a client their finished space? Yeah, I would say like not every project we get to do this, but the ones that we do, like we love it for sure. And I would say one of the best ones ever was, it was a renovation in uh, Langley. And this lady, she's so fun, but halfway through the renovation, she just kept coming to site and she would actually throw parties with her girlfriends. So she would have wine nights like in demolition, in construction, <laughs> and we ordered these fridges. They were from Bosch. They're designed to be built in. They're integrated. And somehow she opened this fridge, mill of construction, hardwood floorings installed, ready to go. Like appliances are not installed yet. Cabinets are not installed. But she got this fridge open, and they have these like clips, and they're these like red clips that have this certain kind of screwdriver that's like no regular homeowner has this kind of weird star shaped screwdriver kind of thing to open it. She opened it, she filled it up with her wine, and it's top heavy now. This fridge is designed to be installed to the wall. It has a anti tip kind of mechanism to get installed, all this kind of stuff. So the fridge actually falls over, and it all the balls, she opened the fridge, it falls over, hits her. And all these bottles of wine just hit her all over. So I got a photo and it looked like she was playing paintball. Like she had all these bruises from bottles of wine just hitting her <laughs> on the fridge. So go to site and the floor is, it's got a dent. And it's, she is going livid being like, oh my God, I spent X amount of money on my flooring. You need to get this replaced, right? So I battled her and I battled the contractor and was like, don't replace it. Like, don't fix it. Don't replace it. Really, it didn't need to be fixed. It was a dent. It was fine. So at the end, the reveal, literally, she was telling all of her friends because she threw a party. She was telling all of her friends that like that's her her war wounds going through the renovation. And the benefit of this was we were able to explain to her like wood is going to dent. These are like love taps that you're going to see on your floor. And it did instill that like we picked the right product for her. So we picked wood that we knew was going to wear. It's going to scratch, dent, chip, all this kind of stuff. And the fact that she was okay with it at the end reveal being like my dent's there. We knew that, you know, her flooring is going to chip and dent more because she's got a dog and she's going to be okay with it over time. So that kind of revealed that like we picked the right product for her. Awesome. So that's pretty much what I've got to ask for you. That's that's an amazing process. I really love 
how it ties everything together. And I'm, I'm really getting a clear picture and I'm sure others listening will as well as to what an interior designer actually does. And it kind of seems as though you've got all these parties that need to come together, but the one that's curating the build to have that perfect end result and to iron all the kinks out and ensure deliveries are on time and products are selected correctly is truly the designer. So they're almost like the blood and the veins of the project, making sure that everybody's tied together and getting everything delivered correctly to the homeowner, which is is something I never really thought of before. So thank you for sharing that. And I wanted to just ask you a couple small personal questions just to round off the episode and then we'll get into wrapping up. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you first was, Now that you've had so much success, you've got your own millwork line, you've got this company that's eight years old, you've got staff, you're you're growing, you're becoming a force in the industry. If you could go and have a conversation with somebody that was just getting started in the industry, what would you say to them? Um, I would say like, you know, the TV shows, Instagram, all this stuff makes it seem very fun to own your own business where it's not so much. Like you're running a team of people, you're running budgets, cash flow, all this other stuff. But what it does is, I keep coming back to it, it gives you the opportunity to craft, obviously, your future, but it also helps you craft other people's future. So like our team, like our team is working well, we're happy, but we're working for that group of people. So it's not necessarily like what's in my bank account, it's how are these people's day-to-day life working out well and how do we bring in a client so I think somebody who's getting into this for you know maybe they want to have a tv show someday or they want to be rich or famous like disregard that thing if you're into kind of just actually adapting and changing lives which I know sounds very kind of high level and corny that's entrepreneurship to me for sure you know, that's funny you say that because I'm releasing an episode this Friday with uh, Barry Hartman. He's the co-founder and CEO of 505 Junk in Vancouver as well. And the quote that I actually pulled out of that episode to post on my social media this afternoon was when him and Scott started the business to create opportunities and growth for themselves. And it wasn't until they hired their first employee that they realized that the the whole purpose behind the business was to provide opportunities and growth for others. So it's amazing to hear you say that as well. And I'm I'm starting to pick up all these little commonalities between entrepreneurs in in the trades business world. It's inspiring. It makes me really happy to see. So I think that's a great message. Thank you for that. Last couple small questions I wanted to ask you is, do you read books or podcasts or audio books? Like, do you consume information outside of design that helps attribute to your business skill? Yeah, I mean, all of the above for sure. I mean, my biggest thing is like, I, I love learning about people. So like biographies, you give me any biography and I will you know, listen to it. I would say just because of the way life has evolved, I would say, yeah, audiobooks or podcasts, those are kind of where it's going, which I know is kind of like a a lazy way of reading. Do you have any favorites? Favorites right now? I would say I just finished up like the Elton John book and I love that. And, you know, Elton John, like I, something has drawn me to him for so long, but I would say it's the battling of the failures for sure. It's getting to an extreme high and then getting knocked down and then getting back up and doing it all over again and over again and over again. And I think that's as, as an entrepreneur, like it's, it can be a very lonely world in some ways. And, you know, there is a lot of highs, like everyone around you at the end of the day, like whether they're your homeowners or your, your employees, like they want to please you. So not always are you getting the nitty gritty, the raw kind of facts where that kind of, there was a lot of things that, I kind of saw in entrepreneurship than like kind of what Elton John went through, which is maybe sounding a little bit crazy, but but yeah, that was probably one of the last ones I read that, that I kind of loved for sure. I saw his movie. I thought it was pretty good. And you definitely get that, that high and low feeling from him as well. His story is pretty crazy. Yeah, I loved it. Do you have any favorite quotes or philosophies or anything that kind of resonates with you or comes back to mind over and over again that you think about a lot? Um, I think, and this might not be like in a quote, but one thing that my mom kind of told me when I was growing up was if I wanted to be a garbage man, like be that garbage man, or if I wanted to be whatever it is in, in life, just be that person, but you better be the damn best at it. And when I was younger, I thought being the best was getting maybe the highest grades, but I think it's just doing that job justice. So That, like I would say, every day I wake up, I go back to thinking that. Because, you know, being a designer just in general can be difficult, where a lot of people might assume it's not. 
And then, you know, dealing with clients can be difficult, but then also just running a business and running a small business and a team of people. Like, you know, when we're a team of five, like when you take one person's attitude in that realm and it's not meshing well, that's 20% of your, your body for eight, 10 hours a day. So I would say just being the best of what I'm going to be and having that ability to just choose what I want to be. And I have certain friends that they at five o'clock like oh thank god like I'm done work whereas I don't really feel that I'm done work and I also don't feel like that I'm gonna ever be done work as far as retiring because this is something that I, I'm enjoying and it's probably gonna involve so I think that just that quote of just being like be whatever you want to be but just be the damn best at it resonated with it every single day I've heard that before, but shout out to your mom. I mean, you've talked about her a couple of times in this episode and it sounds like she's been a massive supporter of yours and, you know, you may not realize it, but that goes a long way. Not, not everybody has that kind of support in their life. So shout out to uh, Jamie Banfield's mom. You sound awesome. Yeah, she's mama bear. Mama bear. Okay. We'll call her mama bear. (laughs) Is there any final thoughts or anything that you want to leave anybody listening to think about or any calls to action or mission statements that you want to leave behind for people to think about? Um, I think just grasping what an interior designer does. Because I think a lot of people might think that it's very fluff or it's too expensive or you don't need it. Where I think if you're connecting into any type of construction, renovation, new build realm, I think the assets of a designer, a designer that follows a process and can implement things correctly and work efficiently, I think they're a must have on your team. And I'll battle anybody that tells me that an interior designer is too expensive for their project because really, like if their job is done correct, like they're saving time and money for sure. Got it. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me on Tools of the Trade. It's been awesome learning what an interior designer really is and what they do. And I hope that other people are able to take that away as well and start deploying the skills of if not you, somebody else in their city and and design with the ethics that you do and the heart that you put into it and, and the passion and the fire that Jamie Banfield brings to their projects. And thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the chat. I loved it for sure. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Tools of the Trade Podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave us a five-star review. For show notes, blog posts, resources, and access to our newsletter, check out toolspodcast.com.